he ended up showing us a bank statement that about knocked us out of our chair. $80,000 deposit on July 5th of coming in on one day. Any stand that does 20 is worth keeping. Pretend I'm not so busy and I'm gonna go do this. Is that doable for someone like me or is it just not the best and highest use of someone's time? He told me the number was 150,000. He's like, if you go a dollar lower, I won't ever talk to you again. It can make in revenue 100,000 a season if you do it right. Well, let's just get into it. So Daniel, why don't you tell me who you are and what you do and what business you got on your hands there? I'm a CPA and kind of operate in two business realms right now. So my main business is building a remote CPA firm. As I started building that about two and a half years ago, about the same time, I bought a firework company, which is really more of a side hustle, especially in Texas where it's only legal to sell, you know, a couple of days a year and maintain my W2 job until about two months ago. So I uh, really built those businesses kind of side by side, but emphasize fireworks more for the first two years of it. Last six months have been emphasizing more of the CPA firm just due to scalability and then also having a business partner and, you know, juggling the balance of aligning our visions while also wanting to do what I want to do and build what I want to build. So you have a partner on the fireworks business, the CPA business, or both? No, fireworks only. So yeah, fi fireworks, I have okay. a 50, 50, 50 partner, uh, silent partner. He, you know, he doesn't publicly share what that we do it just because we, you know, want to keep it private for him. So yeah, we're 50, 50 on fireworks, but uh, CPA wise, hundred percent me. Okay. So tell me about this business. Where did you see it for sale? What did you pay for it? What was your thought process on buying this? I had a client at a CPA firm I worked at, right? So I, I had positioned myself at that firm to be the guy who was taking the new client calls. And what that did, and I highly recommend this for young entrepreneurs, is get yourself in a position to do something beyond what they try to cram you into a corner and do, right? Mm -hmm. You know, as an accountant, they're going to try to get you to prepare as many tax returns as possible. Or if you're on the audit side, they're going to try to get you to cram as many numbers as possible. I got myself in a position where I could take the phone calls. And one of the clients was calling about a different business, but he said, Hey, you know, yeah, I am a businessman. You know, I have this firework company that I run as well. I'm like, Oh, really? Like, what's that? Like, so, well, it's just two little firework stands, nothing crazy. You know, I'm looking to sell it. You want to buy it? He said jokingly, right? Yeah. You're like, maybe. <laughs> yeah. It, that conversation, it's one of those moments where I remember driving home and I was just jazzed. I was so excited. I was mm -hmm. like, man, like, that would be so cool, but it, you know, it just wasn't going to come to fruition at that time. This is like middle of the pandemic. We had just had a third kid. Like we had no money. Like there was no way this is going to happen. And it would have been a conflict of interest. I was like really loyal to my boss at that time. And like, if I even indicated I wanted to do something else, I feel like it would have like cut off the good opportunity I had. Anyways, I ended up leaving that company. And then after the following tax season, I was at a new company. I was like, man, I, I want to do something more. And I remembered the guy's email and I sent him an email and he responded the same day and turned into buying a firework company. What did your email say? Yeah. So I was like, Hey, Mr. Firework, you probably don't remember me, but I did some tax work for you at this other company. You had mentioned wanting to sell your firework business. Is there any chance in heck you're still interested in that? And could I meet you up sometime to talk about it? And we had lunch two days later. How much time had elapsed between those two conversations? A whole year had elapsed from when I had originally started doing some stuff for him and when I reached out to him again, but then two days from, hey, any chance you want to talk about this to sitting down and having a lunch meeting about it. Okay. And then how did the lunch go? Yeah. So we, we met at this place. I'm in San Antonio. And so up on the north side of San Antonio, it's a place called, called Grumpy's Mexican Food. This place is not. Mexican food. <laughs> like it is, but it isn't. It's so Tex-Mex, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's bad. It's bad food. Yeah. And they sell like breakfast stuff, and, but it's like a niche little restaurant in this little town. And that became the headquarters of where we had all these meetings. Like I always say, I bought a firework company at a Mexican restaurant. The lunch went well. My thought was that he was going to want like some number that was just going to like be so big that it, it, you know, it just wouldn't go anywhere. Right. I was thinking like 300, 400,000. Like I knew nothing about buying a business, but just in my head, it was like, yeah, it's going to be some big number and there's just nothing I can do. But in that conversation, he told me the number was 150,000. He was just okay. like, that's what I want. 
He's like, if you go a dollar lower, I won't ever talk to you again. He's like, this is non-negotiable. I know it's worth more than this, but that's my number. He's like, I had one guy come in and try to lowball me. I don't want to deal with that again. I'm not going through that again. 150,000 or it's no deal. That's actually quite refreshing. Like that takes a lot of pressure off of you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's kind of like buying a car and you know exactly what you need to shoot for. Yeah. The question, yeah, it's of like course, you, you was, don't have to worry about that other stuff. You could just focus on that structure. Number. Right. And, and was yeah. it worth it was, you know, I, I had no idea how to gauge that at that point. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm a CPA. Like I've done taxes. I've seen a lot of profit and losses. Like I had some idea of what it meant, but like I had never, you know, I, up to that point I'd watch Shark Tank. That was like my education on what a multiple. So was. no entrepreneurship experience. Right. Yeah. At that point. Wow. I had a little bit in college. I used to buy and sell iPhones. That was like my, okay. That was like my first yeah. venture. Like that got me through school. I've done that. I went to, yeah. to BYU and out in Provo. There's, oh, nice. And uh, out in Utah, there's a company called KSL, right? Like a Craigslist mm -hmm. type company. You can buy yep. and sell things. That's what everyone uses. There's no Craigslist in Utah. Yeah. It's all KSL. Yeah. And uh, I, I put, bought a phone and then sold it. It took like three weeks. I made like 15 bucks. I'm like, yeah, there's not a business there. I tried one more time and that one, I bought the phone, but before I had ever purchased the phone, I had already sold the phone. Smart. I had like 50 bucks on it. And that was a lot for a young college kid with a that's, wife and one kid who was making like 12 bucks an hour. And so that yeah, set off a that's fire. One of my, that's one of my mantras. Sell it before you have it. Yeah. Yep. So that was it though. I'd never acquired anything for sure. So when he said that offhand, you want to buy a, a business? Like you weren't even really looking right then. It's just something triggered in you. You know, I loved firework as a kid, fireworks as a kid. Uh, I grew up in Indiana and uh, you know, every, every state has weird firework laws. Well, when I was like eight, a governor of Indiana, his name is Mitch Daniels. He's like the president of Purdue university now. So random person might okay. know who he is. He, he's a fairly popular politician, but one of the things he did, it legalized fireworks. Right. And as a kid, that was like my first political thing. Like that's the first thing I cared about. Like this guy was going to legalize you. fireworks. And I was like, mom and dad, you got to vote for this guy. Yeah. And so he legalized them and we went to a fireworks store the first time they opened and we went on like July 5th and it was buy one, get three free, right? Bottle rocket. Mm -hmm. We shot those bottle rockets all summer though. We bought over a thousand bottle rockets and we just, we fired them all summer. Me and my brothers, and I had the time of my life. So I had these fond memories of fireworks and I don't know when he said, Hey, do you want to buy a firework business? And, and some of it was the numbers too, right? Like, Oh, you can only be open the way he made it. Sounds like, Oh, you, you know, you're open a weekend and you make like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. It was like, what? Like, it's a lot of money. Okay. So let's, while we're talking numbers, let's talk numbers. He wanted 150 grand. What were the revenues and profits? Yeah. Yeah. So he wanted 150 grand and I said, okay, you know, I want to, check your profit and loss. And he was like, yeah, I don't keep books. I was like, okay. Yeah. Okay. Is so, this like a boomer? Like your typical yeah. Texas boomer? Yeah. Yeah. Real, real nice guy, Love but and an entrepreneur at heart, you know, like 65 and still working like 50 hours a week, not because anybody told him to, but because he loves it. That was it for that meeting. He just said, he said, look, you know, it makes, it, it can make in revenue about a hundred thousand a season if you do it right. Two seasons, right? So 200,000 revenue was kind of like what he said it could make. He's like, this last year, it actually did better. He's like, but we'll, we'll call it 200,000 in revenue. And that was all I had to okay. go off of. And pretty split 50-50 between New Year's and yeah, uh, 4th it, of it, July? He said New Year's was better, which blew my mind. I, I, I had never, I had seen one or two like big New Year's things. And in San Antonio, New Year's is a big fireworks season. Everybody shoots it off at midnight. It's real cool if you're ever... Well, because it's not yeah. a thousand degrees. Exactly. Yeah. But he said New Year's was better. I thought that was weird. It's turned out to be fairly true. After that, I had to kind of figure out how to come up with the money, right? But I still hadn't seen any any numbers or done any due diligence. But he ended up showing mm -hmm. us a bank statement that about knocked us out of our chair. Once and this is once I had a partner. You know, he showed a he showed a bank statement with a eighty thousand dollar deposit on July fifth of whatever year. Jeez. Just eighty thousand dollars coming in on one day, and we were like, "Okay, yeah, that, that's proof. That's proof enough for us." He's like, "You got to trust me. The rest is cash. I don't keep track of it, but you just got to trust that the rest is cash." We were, you know, that's interesting because the best deals I've ever done involved some trust there. 
it's just like, you know what, this could be the deal of a lifetime, but it, there's some hair on it and you just gotta, you gotta swallow the hair or, or you're just going to deal with a mediocre deal. You're spot on it. There's a lot of good businesses out there like that too. The mm -hmm. issue is, is you always got to figure out is the business, the owner or is the business, the business, right? Yeah. Cause you don't want to go yeah. buy a, a service-based business like that. And then it turns out the person is the, all the relationships and he, you know, he sells you the company, but then everybody's still calling him to come out and repair their roof or whatever it is. Now, what time of year are you having these conversations? This was April. It was right after tax season 2022. Okay. So you couldn't be any further away from either holiday. So you can't like, you know, observe how it goes on July 4th. Well, you kind of just got to, that was the anyway, key. Keep going. So he, he tells me in that first conversation, he's like, he, he, he then drive, I follow him over. He takes me over to where he stores everything, right? You, you can't store them in a warehouse. You have to store them in shipping containers. He shows me the operation. He says, look, this is the type of business where once you know it, you know it. And I'm not going to tell you anything else unless you're showing me money by May 1st. So this was April 18th. And he wanted an answer with some money behind it by May 1st. I knew the asking price is 150 I had a grand total saved of zero dollars, <laughs> and mm -hmm. so the question became: How, how the heck am I going to come up with one hundred fifty thousand in twelve days? Now I may have missed this, but remind me again what the profit was: two hundred grand revenue. Yeah, so he and, and he didn't have a good profit and loss, but he he basically said it's it, it's like a fifty percent margin is what he claimed. Jeez. He claimed a fifty percent. So one point five x multiple. Yeah. He claimed, so he Crazy. claimed that, you know, if you, if you make a hundred thousand in a season, he's like, you'll take home about 50 of that. Now, is that you work in the booth? That's, that's with you working, working the booth. Yeah. Working. There were two of them, right? So yeah. One so of there them? were two stands. So hindsight's 2020 in this conversation because he wasn't wrong about what the main stand, right? His main stand and we still on the main stand and that, that is our best performer. We've grown it from two to five. And what we found is that to replicate what he does at that main one and what we now do at that main one is going to take five plus years at each location. So the margin is that good at that stand, but not that good once you create a new location. You can't just like copy and paste it. You just got to, you got to, people have to be familiar with you and it takes time. That main location just has the perfect storm surrounding it. It's close to a couple of the really big companies. It's right off of a main highway. Anywhere you go in San Antonio, if you want to recreate that, there's already a bunch of other people there. He just happened to be, he, he got there 10 years ago before anybody else got there. Okay. Is this the one by the copy, coffee shop? Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm just, I want to look at it on Google Maps. Yeah. Yeah. The one by the coffee shop. North of San Antonio, you got a huge neighborhood across the street. You got a, like a substation right next door. All right. So it's like, a, is it a four or six lane highway? A uh, four lane highway. And then who owns the land? We rent from a guy who rents from the owner. So it's a sublease from a subleaser. And okay. Yeah. So, but as far as we know, it's just a, a, some family, you know, who's had the land for years and worth a lot of money. And then what do you pay for that? Yeah. So if I were stands are interesting because you really don't pay monthly. We just set a price with each of our landlords. I'm not going to say it. The only reason I'm not going to say it is, is that, you know, if a landlord were to go to find the podcast, I, I'd hate for us to want to go get a new location. And, sure, and when sure, you sure. a new location, you got to start low. We pay premium for that one. Uh -huh. But like a new location, like the minimum is usually about 2000 a season. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's not like it, a percentage of sales at least. Right. And somebody might want that. And if it was a good enough location, you know, I mean, we're usually pretty open to, to anything, but we've usually just settled on like a, a standard number. Like, all right, we'll pay you this per season. We try to negotiate the pay after the season just because it's, you know, we only make revenue twice a year. A couple of the landlords have been pretty okay with that. Other ones have been like, yeah, no way. And, and that's fine. Okay. You know, you just kind of have to, factor that into saving up from the prior season. Could you not speed up the process of like making a really profitable location by just like really investing time and money into finding the best intersection or location possible? 
You that probably could, but the, the zoning laws for fireworks are that, real That was tough. my next question. Yeah. yeah. You can only put a firework stand. They can't be inside any, any city limit inside of Texas. So any incorporated wow. city limit, you can't be inside. So you can only hmm. be in the county and unincorporated areas. Texas has very aggressive zoning laws though, right? So San Antonio is one of the largest cities just by landmass, like in the United States. It's just a massive city. And when you compare the city of San Antonio to, to, to the county it's in, it's like 98% of the county. You have to find the spots. And then it's just a matter of finding the rent that someone who will rent it to you. And then a lot of people don't want them there year round. Our main one we're able to keep there year round, but most of them we have to pay somebody to bring it in and bring it out. And that's usually about 1500 a season to, to move a stand in and out. Okay. So two grand per season, like, I know that's like a minimum, it's a range, but it's a, it's a single digit percentage of your revenue, but it's hard to find locations. They can't be in the city limits. Ideally you're able to leave it there year round, but usually not. Do you, do you leave the, like how many fireworks are left over? I know they don't really expire, right? Do you, do you leave them yeah. there on site or somewhere else? No, so they have they have like a five year shelf life, which is great. We usually store them off site though, because uh, theft is a huge thing in in the firework business. So okay. you really don't want to leave any fireworks at your locations, and so we don't leave any at our locations. We okay. store everything. Kind of got to hide them then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you can't put it in a storage unit. It's got to be in a shipping container, but it can't be obvious. Some unmarked shipping container somewhere. Yeah. Yep. And that's exactly what we do. Okay. So. You learned pretty quickly that one location was just amazing. It's kind of the 80-20 rule, right? And the other one was just new and small. So we bought the business from the guy, right? With the one location for certain. And then this other, the second location, he ran it that season, right? So he brings us in July. That was the deal. Pay me a down payment. Watch me run the business. And then I'll teach you everything from there. Mm -hmm. And then pay me the rest of it at the end of that season. And you get nothing from this first season. He had us at a location. and. It, he, he was like up front. He's like, it didn't do well. And, and the summer of 2022 was a really bad drought. So overall, he just didn't do well that season. So like we were pretty concerned, right? He did like 30% less in sales than he had showed us. And it was like, he, he, he like gave us an out. He's like, hey, if you want, I can give you money back. Like, I, I'm regretting even wanting to get out of it. We're like, no, we want to stick with it. December comes along, right? And we think we're going to have these two locations. And we get in contact with where we're going to go back to. And the guy was like, oh, hey, I don't want you guys back. We're like, wait, what do you mean? He's like, wait, back up real quick. So you ended up buying it after July then? Like officially? Yeah. yeah. So we okay. made a down payment before July and then and then made the second payment in like August. And then okay. that's and when you brought we exchanged hands and everything. Gave us the okay. keys. And you brought in a partner to help fund it because I imagine it's cash only. Brought in a partner to fund it and then and then made a seller's note with the seller. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. So he, he took some seller financing, but yeah, I brought on a partner for me to personally get the money. I had to do a bunch of hocus pocus, you know, second mortgage, lending, getting some money from friends and family. It, it was, it was a stretch, but I, I made it work real quick. I'll just say I not understanding anything about margins. I'm really glad I didn't know then what I know now, because what I know now I might not have, I might've got too yeah. scared. You know, there was too much risk, yep. but the obliviousness and the naivety has really profited. It's a superpower. Yeah. <laughs> Ignorance I, is bliss. It can I be heard you say that with the ATM, the, I, the, on the ATM guys uh, podcast episode, you know, he's like the margins ended up being better than they thought, thankfully. And, and there's some truth to that. Interesting. Yeah. Sometimes it goes the other way. Uh, you know, a lot of times it's worse. In fact, usually it's, it ends up being not as good as you forecast, but sometimes it's the opposite. Okay, so you, you you scramble all this money together, you close in August, and then you just sit on your hands, I assume, until December. Yeah, and, and at that point, it was just you know a lot of the little things we we switched. You know, we, we he saw the inventory left over, so we had to count all the inventory to pay him for that. Right, he just gave it to us at cost. You know, yeah, and then just getting used to things. We had to do maintenance. He had some deferred maintenance he hadn't done. But yeah, we we thought we were going to have the one that was always where it was at, and then we thought we were just going to. And he had even offered, Hey, I'll move it back to the other location for you for one season. And like, we hadn't even had to fathom, like, how do you move these things? They're 10,000 pound metal boxes, right? Like he had done all of that. He had a truck that he did it himself. Right. So December like 14th rolls around, right? Like 10 days before the season. And we're like, Hey, we're going to go to that spot. And he's like, yeah, let me just call the owner. And 
he didn't call him. And so the next day I'm like, you know, I'm just going to call this owner guy. I call him. I'm like, Hey, I'm the firework guy. Yeah. We're just making sure we can move in next weekend. He's like, no, I, I don't want you back. What do you mean? You don't and this work? was the more or the less profitable location, the less profitable one. Okay. Okay. And, and which was a brand new location the summer of 2022. Anyways, long story short, we, we don't get that location. Luckily the old owner comes through. He has another spot he had once had. He makes a deal with the guy and we get into that spot, but it was like a one-time thing. Well, what was his reasoning? Why didn't he want you? It was on the property of a restaurant. And he said he felt like uh, the local people didn't like it there. And we had seen some chatter in the fa- in a Facebook group where they're like, why do they have that ugly fireworks stand there? And mm. this is a small community. Keep it quiet. I think he didn't want it to tarnish his brand. I totally get that. Like I have a shop, like a small warehouse. And I said no to 60 pr- prospective tenants because it's like, no, I don't want any signage. I don't want any customers. Like I was so picky. It took me like six months, which is, you know, tens of thousands of missed rent. Cause like, I just didn't want to mess with it. You know, the reputation and just looked, I didn't want it to look bad. So I get that. In total respect for him. And I'm really glad it didn't work out because it, it forced us by, by January, you know, January 3rd, 2023, you know, we're six months in this thing. We now have to find a new location before July. And at that point we had fully paid off the other guy. Like we're separated from him. We're on our own. We got to figure out how to move these things. So then we, then we really got into the business mode. We so, stopped holding our hand and we had to just go in and figure out everything. Okay. So the backup place that you got, how do you think it did compared to how the old place would have done? A little bit better, but not much better. Okay. And we could only be there for three days. So we had to move it in like December 28th and be gone by January 1st. It was like, Hmm. whereas the other one, we could have been there for two weeks. So it might've done a little bit better, but it was a decent location and he had been there before. So people knew there had been a fireworks stand there. So overall that one did okay that season. We were, we were happy with how it did. But it was just for one season. One season. And we tried to go back later and the guy said, absolutely not. We now are about a half a mile from there, we have a location and we kept the same color stand. So people know it's us. And, but our first season at the new one was our worst. That was our worst location this last season. So. Wow. What, what do you think made it so bad? When you're there for the first time, it, you're, you're hit or miss on, on if people are going to be receptive to you, right? Fireworks is like, it's not like any other business, you know, people don't even really go- like they might Google fireworks near me, but because you pass these places and they're, you know, the big indoor stores are so visible year round. Most people just know to go there. When you put in a pop-up stand, you're kind of betting on the fact that people are going to tr- come try you. Maybe they know you have better prices. The, the big guys charge or they a assume. lot of money. Yeah. It's kind of like the boy who cried wolf in a way because people drive by you for 359 days a year and you're not open out of sight, out of mind. And then their brain is supposed to flip over to, Oh, I need to buy from this person. Yeah. It doesn't compute. Yeah. You're, you're, you're spot on. And I mean, I, I have people who drive past my fireworks stand every day. Like they go to the coffee shop and I'll be like, yeah, I own the fireworks stand behind the coffee shop. And they're like, Oh, that's a fireworks stand. It's like, yeah, (laughs) Oh, I guess I, I don't buy fireworks. So I didn't even realize Yeah. They don't even see it. And it's right there. Okay. So then you went to a new location and it just totally bombed. And are you thinking like, we got to move again or. So this is the interesting piece and and sorry, maybe there was a little confusion there, right? So January, 2023, we, we had done the one-time location. We now had to go find our own location. So the place that's like a half mile from there was actually this last season, right? That's when we have five locations. We go to a place down the road from the one that we had been kicked out of, but it, it's a popular place where there's a big bar and people are there all the time on the weekends, right? It's just like in Texas is really popular, you know, it's always hot here. They'll have, there's these big bars that have these big outdoor areas and they'll have like mini concerts there. 
All right. If you are watching this clip right now, you are watching this on YouTube. And if you are a fan of podcasts, please check out my podcast while you're at it, because sometimes I have podcasts that aren't on YouTube and sometimes I have YouTubes that aren't on podcasts. So check out the Kerner office on any podcast platform, or you can go to tkopod.com. Also, my newsletter, we'll throw that in there. There are no ads. It's weekly. It's different content than my podcast and YouTube newsletter.chrisjkerner.com. You'll see the link and we'll see you there. And we contact that owner and we say, hey, we think we could be a good firework stand location there. It takes five months negotiations. And we finally, they finally said, yes, we had us there. And that one did pretty good. What is good? Like 40 grand? Any stand that does 20 is worth keeping, right? 20 20 is kind of like the baseline. Yeah. You know, if you can do 20 at a spot, it's worth investing in the spot. This one did like double that. And so it was like, okay, nice. but see at that point, we only, so had I two guess st- I said 40, I said 40. Yeah. I was right. Nice. Yeah. At this point we have two stands and one of them is doing much more than 40, right? That one just does bonkers. And then we have one that does 40 and it's like, wow, okay. You know, we can repeat this. And that's where we run into our competitor when we're returning our U-Hauls that we use to, to, to haul stuff. We run into our competitor. We see him. We go up and shake hands with him. We had heard of this guy. He had originally been a partner or worked with the guy we had bought our business from. We had heard a lot about him. And we go up and shake hands and he says, hey, I'm ready to get out of this business. Do you guys want to talk about buying what I have? We said, now, let me yeah, ask absolutely. you this. Like, sorry, but why? Like this to me, I'm sold. I love the business. I don't care that it's seasonal. Why does he want to get out of it? Like, can't you like eat crap for seven days a year? Yeah. So the issue is it goes back to a $20,000 location. One that can do that is okay. But, you know, just imagine, you know, 20,000, right? That's your revenue. Your product cost, let's just say is a third of that, a third of the 20,000. Okay. So what? 6,000, right? So 2,000 for rent. So you're down to 18,000, 6,000 for the product. All right. So you're down to 12,000. Your labor's Four grand. All right. So you're down to 8,000. It's 1,500 to move them in. All right. You're down to 6,500. You got to buy a U haul to move everything around. All right. You're down 500. You're down to like four to 6,000 bucks that you make on a location. Because it's, you're not to scale. You need good locations. Yeah. And if all you're making is that, then it's just not good. And his locations used to do well. There was this boom for fireworks during the pandemic because everybody wanted them. And he had seen the boom. And after the boom was over, it just wasn't as good. And he had started another business and he was like, Hey, I'm ready to get out. I yeah. want to focus on my other business. I get that. Yeah, and okay. His locations had started doing badly and it reflected the fact that he had started putting less time into it. Mm-hmm. So this was a competitor and how many, so you had two still, you started with two. How many did he have? He had two operating, but he had an additional stand that he just didn't use. Okay. So he had so, three, okay. but even then it was like one and a half operating because he, he, he was really only doing the work at one of them and he had just leased the other one out to some other firework stand owner. Gotcha. This okay. is, at this point we're at July of 2023. Okay. And he, we Se- say, hey, how did your season over. go? And we had just done 40 at our brand new location and he had done like 20 at his and he was like, I'm done. Yeah. And then he had just let somebody else run on the other spot for like a thousand bucks. So he, he just wasn't making the money. And so we come in, we buy all three of his, he has the two locations. We say, we're going to run on that other location. And this is where we learned that the business is more difficult to scale than it really was because the, the main one we thought, Oh, if he did 20, we can do 30. We only did like 23. He had just leased to somebody else. That one did only did like 8,000. It bombed. We lost money mm. on it. But once again, we, when we just put our minds together and we, me and my partner, we're really good at finding locations. When we put it on, we put that third one that he wasn't using as all on its own location. And that one did really well. What did it do? About 30. Okay. So that first season. And we're talking, this was January, 2024, basically. Correct. Yep. Okay. And what did you pay for these, for the business, for the three locations? Yeah. We paid around a hundred grand. Okay. Which was a good deal because we needed to grow and we wanted to grow. 
it wasn't as worth it as the first acquisition yeah. was. Yeah, still a good deal. Not a great deal, but you want to scale. And I kind of look at this a lot like the vending industry where it's like you're also paying for a location. It yeah. takes time and money to find a location. Yep. Okay, so you've had one season with five locations. Or you did, and now you've Two seasons. You just had your second. Yeah. So how did that go? So, so July 2024, right? So three or four months ago, we get rid of the one that only did like eight. We just move out of there completely. And there's a whole story for that. I could tell you a great story about that. The owner of the land put his own fireworks stand right next to ours. That's why it did so bad. <laughs> just because the lease was probably like one page and didn't protect you against that. Oh yeah. None of these guys are good at keeping leases. We, we've had to overhaul the leases. What did that one do when he was right next to you? Did you leave it there? That was the one that only did 8,000. Yeah. I and mean, what did eight, it do eight, the, the season before? We don't know. Cause he, that's where he had just leased it out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So well, how did that conversation go when you you roll up one day and you see another one right next door? Yeah. You, you'll love this. So we bought the we bought the the second business like we acquired our competitor about August of 2023 right so 14 months ago on like October 5th we get a call this is from the guy we had been acquiring it from and he says hey look I feel real crappy about this but I'm just gonna tell you how it is the guy at that one location he's putting his own fireworks stand on there he says that the lease is null and void because I moved off. Turns out I can't even find a copy of it, and I'm sorry. He, he's just like, look, I'm sorry. Like, if it, if this is a deal breaker, guys, I'm sorry. Like, I, I can give you your money back. Like, he he was genuinely remorseful. But we were like, you know what? Like, crap happens. Like, if we're going to be business people, you know, like, crap's going to happen. Yeah. And we're just going to have to learn to deal with it. And so he's like, if you want to make a deal with him, he's willing to offer you one season to see how it works. You, but you have to show up tomorrow with $3,000. We're like tomorrow. Hmm? He's like, he's giving you till tomorrow. I don't understand. 3,000. This is like the landowner that's about to compete with you. He wants 3,000. Yeah. To, for, to go away or what? No, he wants 3,000 for us to be able to be there for that season. Otherwise what we're going to lose the season location that, 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 that guy had been operating on for five plus years. So he wants $3,000 and he's going to compete with you no matter what. Yeah. Now, the caveat there is, is that he said he was going to compete, but he, he's one of those guys who's kind of all talk. Like he didn't have a stand. He hadn't bought his license. He hadn't done anything to that point. And we're in mid-October. So we thought maybe it was all talk. So we went over, made a deal with him. We told him, exa- we, we forced him though. We were like, we want to be exactly where we've been. You can't be, you need to be at least 20 feet from us. We, we got some of the things we wanted from it enough to say you know what like let's just let's just do this and uh, yeah we we had to show up the next day with three grand and do the deal it was do the deal now or don't get off my property yeah and in retrospect you would have not done the deal yeah sure i mean in retrospect like knowing what i know now yeah i would no i would never i would never be on the same property as another stand again but with the time constraints we had it's it takes a long time to find a good location like people don't just hey i'm gonna bring my fireworks stand over and shake hands with you like we've found it takes an average of like four to six months to just do a deal like you have to approach someone they got to think about it you got to explain it to them back and forth and back and forth and back and forth till they finally agree and you write them a check or give them cash see it's this is tough it's tough because it's like i like baking asymmetric bets right? Where I can like invest $10 and get a hundred or, or lose all 10. That's asymmetric, right? Yeah. This is like an asymmetric bet for the landlord in the wrong direction. Like downside versus upside. His downside is, you know, and like this probably isn't realistic, but if they don't know the fireworks industry, they're thinking this thing could explode. I could get sued. He's thinking that's the downside. And his upside is two grand, three grand. Like it doesn't make sense. So is there anything you could do to align your incentives better? Be like, listen, this thing can make a hundred grand. I'm going to give you 10% of that. My success is your success. Is that a thing? Honestly, it could be. It would, it would be contingent on, on having a location where somebody wants your, your thing on their property year round. And we've found that the best locations, that's just very difficult. So one of the new ones we found it, we, 
it's on the property year round and it's great and it's a good location, but the reason they let it be on the, on it year round is they're not doing anything with that land. It just happens to be at an intersection where the owner of it is a, a company that might build a restaurant there someday. Any stuff off a of main highway, there's already so much demand there. They really don't, there's just not a lot of room that they want to bring a yeah. fireworks stand. And put it's it like the look, you know, real estate, everyone wants the highest and best use. This is like the lowest and worst use. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah. So how much does a license cost and you need one per location? Yeah. You buy, you buy one per location. Surprisingly, the licensing is not, not bad. You're getting a state license and then you're getting a, a county license. So it's only a couple hundred bucks per location. Is there any other red tape other than just zoning? Ton of it. Any other place, right? Like you can, most other states, you can do a pop-up tent, right? If you ever go to get fireworks in most states, you know, around the 4th of July, there's tents out inside Walmart parking lots, Kroger parking lots, malls. There's always places. In Texas, you can only sell out of a enclosed container, preferably a shipping container. If not, you have to build it out of like a certain material. It has to fit all these things. The barrier to entry is tough. You have to have certain electrical and then, and then it's county based, right? So like one county's fire marshal will have one set of rules, or at least he only enforces three rules. Mm -hmm. But then we have one county where the fire marshal is like enforcing like all 25 of the state's guidelines. And like, if you don't have everything to a T, they shut you down. What are like the most difficult things to adhere to? Just, just that, the, the fact that you have to operate out of the container, right? And then moving the containers, it's just it's just not an easy business to like dive into, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, how many, how many people do you know who, who can pick up a shipping container and move it? Oh, I've had it done before. I've got, I've got some stories about that, man. Yeah. Oh, geez. I, I could tell you shipping container stories, but it, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. There's you don't even have power of... there on site, do you? Or do you? You got it. You got to do it from a generator and then generator. you don't have bathrooms on site for your people. So you, you know, do you get a porter potty or do they go you go to the coffee shop? <laughs> yeah. The coffee shop doesn't have a bathroom. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, it's just yeah, like a drive through drive through only place. Okay. Yeah. So this last season was the best one we've had so far, just overall operational wise. We've, we've got it where we have managers running each stand. We found a good fifth location. So now we have five solid locations Two of them are year round. The other three we're moving in, moving out. But now we have a, a season under our belt at each one of them. This will be the first season where we have all five locations, not a single one of them new. And at this point, we're just, we're, we're both really enjoying just wanting to build it the way it is. We, we don't really see ourselves wanting to grow anymore because I'm very focused on building my CPA firm. Uh, my business partner is very focused on his career. Our families, you know, we both got kids, multiple kids. And so for me, I see it as a, as a good cash flowing asset that I hold. And then I think the biggest key is that it, it keeps me true to my brand, right? What I love about what you're doing and your podcast and, and, and your channels is you're true to that co-founder's brand, right? You're true to these scrappy guys coming in there, you know, I'm assuming from probably not much, right? You know, maybe a degree that your family maybe helped you with, right? I, I don't know your whole story, but, and, and you're building the yeah. American dream in multiple ways and you're helping others do it. And for me, that's one of the reasons I think I'll just probably keep fireworks as a piece of my assets, put it under a holding company for the future. It keeps me true to my brand. I'm a small business guy. I'm a scrappy entrepreneur and I can look an entrepreneur in the eye as their CPA and say, Hey, I know what you're going through. I know what it's like to have somebody cancel your lease two days before you're supposed to sell. I know what yeah. it's like to have an employee steal money from you. I know what it's like to have bad accounting. This I know what it's like to have a landlord compete directly with you and have <laughs> absolutely nothing you can do about it. Most people do not know what that's like. I don't think I've ever experienced that. Yeah. And I, so I love it for that aspect. It's, it's helping me grow what, what's going to be a small business entrepreneurial empire of my own that all started with a fireworks stand and a phone call at a CPA firm when I was 25 years old. Yeah, that's awesome. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the professor, the entrepreneurship professor or business professor that never had a business. 
right? Yeah. It's like, ah, you're speaking okay. from a textbook and you're like, hey, I'm speaking from real life. What do you think you'll do in revenue this year? You're like optimized. You've got five, you've got solid locations. What are you hoping to do in December? Yeah. So that season, the the goal is to get up to 200,000 for five locations, right? Okay. The, thinking back to the beginning, it was 100,000 for two. Our mm -hmm. thought was, oh, you add two more, you're at 200,000. You add five, you're at 250. Easy. It, it's been a struggle to get the two. The goal is to get the two. We want to get 200,000 in revenue for the five locations. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll get there this season, but I would bet it, the election might affect it, right? If the election goes one way, we, we very well may have a, the best season of our life. And it's crazy to think that that could happen, like an election affecting me, but it could what about Diwali? Is that an opportunity? You know, it's funny you ask. Diwali is a cool season and we really want to sell for it. But the state allows you to sell, but your county has to give you permission. And we were denied by the county due to we haven't had a lot of rain. And they said due to the drought conditions, they they didn't want to let us sell. But I think Diwali could be huge. Like I've we've thought of just building out a whole company being the main one to do Diwali because the big guys don't do Diwali because it's not, it's not worth it for them. Yeah. All right. Let me ask you this. So pretend I'm not so busy and I'm going to go do this, right? Cause that's what I do. I chase shiny objects and I've been importing stuff from China for 15 years, been to China a couple of times. Doesn't scare me. Let's say I, I bought shipping containers before I'm going to buy a shipping container. I'm going to buy some fireworks. I'm going to get my licenses, find a location. Is that doable for someone like me? Or is it just not the best and highest use of someone's time? It's doable. The reason that I'm not even a huge proponent for every business doing acquisition entrepreneurship. In this one case, I'm really glad we did it that way. Because I think it would be really hard to go have a really good profitable season just doing it cold turkey. Mm -hmm. But you might if you can find the right location and if you're scrappy enough, you know, maybe nobody's doing great marketing for fireworks. There's a, there's a guy in Kansas who's developing a whole marketing company for firework companies. The marketing is really tough. I mean, how, how do you do, you can't advertise. Nobody will let you advertise fireworks because they're considered firearms and lethal. How do you advertise? Yeah, man. I, I've been literally, that's been in the back of my brain as we've been talking like, it's such a, such a location driven business. I would experiment. Everything's a test, right? So it might not be profitable, but I would love to have someone out there by the road in like the week leading up to it for just like rush hour, morning and afternoon, maybe two hours each with a massive sign, like a countdown sign. And it's just like seven days until we're open, six days until we're open, five days. And then get like, you know, you, you see like the inflatables, they've got like big inflatables, like for marketing. And then they've got like massive ones that are like 30, 40 feet tall. They probably cost a few grand. I'd buy one of those things and just like let my freak flag fly for the week leading up to it. When you looked at it on Google there a moment ago, did, did you see the, the, the van with the arrow on top? Uh -uh. Just go back and Google it real quick. And I guess anyone who's listening, just Google big arrow fireworks. There's a reason we're called big arrow because the the owner, I, I kind of had a McDonald's moment, you know, Ray Kroc seeing the golden arches. Uh -huh. When I first saw the big arrow, it's a 23 foot arrow that he mounted oh, on top cool. of a van. I don't see it. I'm looking at the one next to Apollo. Yeah. In, the arrow. So go go to the website, bigarrowfireworks.com. Okay. Okay. I got that yeah. pulled up too. I see it. Yeah. That's massive. But it's like something has to be dynamic about it or you just, your eyes get used to it, right? We've got some big blow up rockets we've done. There's something I've almost lost the 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 passion to go you know get get out there and, and wave signs but let, we've, we've done some sign waving but yeah you know there 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 are some major things you could do with marketing i think to really bring in a lot of people and maybe i just need to re kind of have that that chris chris kerner energy and, and say you know what let's let's freaking do this let's invest some money into I'm, just I'm going crazy you. and getting people to come in i mean here's a couple ideas so when I had my iPhone repair shops, my third location was bad. It was a bad location. It was in Huntsville, Alabama. It was the busiest intersection in the, in the county. 60,000 cars per day went through that intersection. And it was like an L-shaped shopping mall. And I was in like the elbow of the L. Like far from the road, tucked back. My signage could only be like so big. 
And so like, despite being in an amazing intersection, it was a bad location. If we didn't have a sign spinner out, our sales in a day would be like $200, which is like three iPhone repairs. Yeah. But when we put a sign spinner out there, it would be like $1,500. It was just like night and day. So clear. This is effective. This works. You can also buy for like 2,500. They have like mechanical robots that you plug in with an extension cord and they hold a sign and they just like rotate. Yeah. And it looks kind of creepy. You could do something like that. If I were you, I would even, and I know I'm looking at the, the signage of the arrow on your website and it looks very affixed, but I would find a way to weld that off, remove it. Like I, you could be doing yourself a disservice. Like I know it's convenient and affordable to be there year round, but to appear that you're there year round, you know, mm. it, cause it's like, you want people to be in the habit and to remember that you're there every year, which is the strength of being there for years at a time. But you want that cue to be triggered when it's almost time to buy. So they're not like, so their eyes aren't so used to seeing that arrow. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and, and what you're getting at there is, is it's the classic business dilemma. You can never, you can never underestimate the value of having a interaction with your customer. Mm -hmm. and, and that includes if the arrow is moving versus not moving, catching those eyes. I, I think that's huge. And I think it's easy. We, we've had five seasons now and we've seen that it's been pretty consistent across the seasons. And I think it's been easy to kind of be like, oh, okay, well, you know, it just sort of happens and it does. Yeah. Maybe we need to have a little more faith in Dude, and, you just got to get wacky with it. Adding some flavor. Five, five locations is like, not an A, B test, but it's an A, B, C, D, E test. Like you could test five different marketing angles at all five locations and then just compare those sales against July. Yeah. Not a bad it's idea. Like, wow. This one was up 5%. This one was down 5%, which tells us the marketing didn't do anything. This was up 30%. We need to do that at all five in the summer. Yeah. You know, I'd love to say like, oh, you need to do Google ads. You need to do email, but like, no. I don't think so. You can't do Google ads. The email thing, that that's what this guy in Kansas does. He's he's helping companies get good email lists and good text lists and you know, just getting back in your That is interesting. Spaces. That is interesting. And what I've seen people come in sometimes they want to do a deal, right? If they want to spend $1000 on fireworks, they want you to throw in a few things. And I've been wanting to teach the managers who we have to to really get a little bit better at the negotiating thing because you don't want somebody who is unskilled in negotiating, like, oh, okay, they bought a thousand, so I give them 500 free, you know, like, yeah, that's not good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, but at the same time, like you, you want to do things that gets people to come back and we've had it where we got some emails of people, we sent them emails and a couple of them came back. So I think I need to have a little more faith in that too. Maybe a QR code or something like, Hey, we, we have a high mm -hmm. Google review count. Cause we, you know, get a free firework. If you leave a Google review. Maybe we need to do that for the other stuff too. It's just it, the the one last thing I'll tell you about fireworks is you, you everything you learn and everything you're like, oh, I want to do that next season. All that's on your mind on July 5th. And if you don't record those yeah. feelings, then by October 25th, which is today, it's all feelings you used to have. And it's hard to get, get those back. I'm going to completely walk back what I said about email. The more I think about that, because I think if you were to do something kind of quirky, like have delicious cookies there, like chocolate chip cookies or something, or, or ice cold water or soda or something. It's like, Hey, and like, don't involve the fireworks at all. You don't want to touch your margin, but it's like, Hey, if we can get your phone and email, you can have this free soda or free cookie and asterisk. We are only going to reach out like a week before the holiday twice. We'll reach out to you twice a year. We don't want to spam you. We just want to remind you, like you're just being totally transparent. We want to remind you that you're here. I bet you that could make a massive difference. Yeah. And when people buy fireworks, they want to get the best quality and the best deal. You got to have faith to get in front of them. Man, this is good. Thank you, Daniel. I appreciate your time. Where can people find you if they want to reach out? Best thing, uh, you know, biggerfireworks.com, obviously for this one, spelled like it sounds. On LinkedIn, it's Daniel Astleford. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, you know, 4,000 followers. I'm looking to grow that to 10 by the end of next year. So ask the Ford, it's like castle and Ford, no C. So A S T L E F O R D. Castle Ford. Never heard There's that. There's only one. two of us in America in the world. So wow. There's me Very and he's the CEO of a hospital, the other guy, but I'm sure he doesn't okay. want to hear about, hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, Daniel, thank you. This was super interesting. I'm excited to release it. Cool. Chris, thank you. All right. What'd you think? Please share it with a friend and we'll see you next time on the Kerner Office.